leading Britain's conversation. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago, and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? I don't want to be rude, but you have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day! Yourself, Mr. Van Rompuy, say that the euro has brought us stability. I could applaud you for having a sense of humour. Yes, I want you, Zach, Mr. Schultz, as well. I want you all fired. Nigel Farage. 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 The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald. Well, the government have just been defeated in the House of Lords, and this, of course, is part of a long battle ever since Independence Day on June the 23rd last year. There have been attempts through the High Court, attempts through the Supreme Court, attempts through the House of Commons, and now the government finally in the House of Lords has been defeated on something. Interestingly, at this point about whether EU citizens that legally came to this country should have their rights guaranteed is something that completely unified the Leave campaign last year. Not one campaigner ever suggested those people who'd come legally should have their rights questioned. Many of us thought uh, that immediately after Brexit or perhaps after the declaration of Article 50 we should start putting some limits on. Uh, but it was the government, it was Amber Rudd, uh, who seems to think this should be used as a negotiating chip. Now, given that there are about three and a half million EU nationals living in the UK and a million or fewer UK citizens living in Europe, uh, one wonders how much of a chip she really thought this was. Uh, but I want to go straight to Theo Usherwood, BBC's political correspondent. Theo, the government have been defeated. Theresa May is supposed to be going next Thursday to Brussels to trigger Article 50. What does the government now do? Uh, yes, we are now into the territory of parliamentary ping-pong. Uh, the government has been defeated on an amendment tabled cross-party amendment but tabled by the Labour benches uh, which would safeguard the rights of EU nationals living in the UK, there are around three million of them, before uh, Theresa May triggers Article 50. They've been defeated by 102 votes. 358 plays 256. It's a big defeat and of course now the bill heads back to the Commons, it will be overturned. But while that's going on, Nigel, there are going to be lots of backroom negotiations to try and pick off those uh, Conservative peers, and we'll get the list soon, who rebelled against their own party to say, hang on a moment, you cannot defy the will of the British people on this one, because Theresa May, in her view, Prime Minister's view, needs to be able to head into those negotiations with the strongest hand uh, possible. And the government's take on this is, if it cannot, uh, it, it does not need uh, to go into those negotiations, having already guaranteed the rights of EU nationals, because, of course, those 27 other EU member states haven't guaranteed uh, the rights of British expats living abroad, predominantly Spain and then France and Germany uh, afterwards. And that's why the government has taken this position. You're quite right, Nigel. There was cross, uh, there was a cross uh, support, you know, across the Leave campaign during the, during the referendum uh, campaign for... Uh, the rights of EU nationals already living in the UK to be able to remain here. Uh, and uh, th there was a heated debate about it between, as I referred to earlier, Will Straw, the director of the Remain campaign, who said this could be an issue, and, uh, and Peter Bone of Grassroots Out. Uh, uh, but Theresa May, and this is the issue for Theresa May, because she's always been very clear that by implementing Brexit, she is implementing uh, the will of the British people. She's implementing what people voted for on June the 23rd. But this is something that people didn't vote for on June the 23rd because it wasn't part of uh, the Leave campaign, uh, Leave, Leave campaign manifesto. Now, moving on, I've just got I've been uh, key moments, if you like, in this debate. Uh, Baroness Hater of Kentish Town opened the debate for the Labour Party. And it's legitimate of them to think they're being used as negotiating capital because that's exactly what the Home Office told them. Now, all of three, these three million and indeed the four of us whose names are on the amendment also share a real concern for those UK expats who, thanks to their uh, EU membership, have settled in one of the other 27 countries. 
Now, uh, in the past week, there's been a bit of a heated row between Lord Tebbit and Michael Heseltine. Lord Tebbit even saying on LBC that he thinks Lord Heseltine, for his remain, uh, remain rhetoric, should be kicked out of the Conservative Party. Uh, and he didn't miss the opportunity in this debate uh, to have uh, another dig at his old foe. I think I should, first of all, in a manner which has not been followed by anybody else in this House today, declare my interest in this matter. I have... First of all, a nephew who has lived and worked in Germany for 20 years. And I have a Danish son-in-law who has lived in this country for over 30 years. Secondly, I would like to say what an extraordinary experience it has been here today. Yeah. First of all, we have been unfortunately and unusually denied the presence of my noble friend Lord Heseltine, who strangely is not in his usual place to speak to us. The problem for Lord Tebbit there was that Lord Heseltine was hiding away on one of the back benches on the government side of the House of Lords. Interesting uh, contribution from John, John Sentamu, uh, the Archbishop of uh, York, who, who said he actually supported Theresa May's position. All this little bill is doing is just like a race about to start. On your mark, set, bang, then they take off. And it will take two years, friends, to run this race. And during the running of that race, we want to ensure that actually concerns which are being raised in this come back. Now, if, if, as I do, want to see that there is this decision which the government takes on behalf of all of us, that you as citizens should be given a guarantee to remain, the best way to do it is to call the bluff of Angela Merkel. Well, thank you. Thank you, Theo Usherwood, LBC's political editor. Um, it's going to be a fascinating week. Uh, this is going to go back and forth. I wonder, should the unelected House of Lords be getting involved in this at all? Uh, I'm not so sure they should. I suspect their popularity uh, will go down. Although the issue itself, I haven't got a problem with. And I was amazed, actually when Theresa May and Amber Rudd decided they would make this an issue when it was perfectly clear from all of us on the Leave side we didn't want the rights of anybody who'd come to Britain legally to be challenged. There's going to be... This is, this is going to dominate British politics for the next week and maybe beyond. And I wonder what Scott in Glasgow makes of all of this. Uh, hello, Nigel. It's uh, actually an honour to hear be speaking with you. Uh, I got to see you speak in uh, Glasgow University when you were up here for the grassroots uh, movement. And uh -huh. I finally get to talk to you. You but, do? Um, yes. As you can tell, I'm not originally from Glasgow. Um, I am American. Um, I've been living in Britain for almost five years now, and I've gone through the immigration policy, and I don't see what all the fuss is about. Obviously, 30, 40 years ago, they had some kind of a policy if a German or a French person would want to, you know, immigrate to Britain. Yeah. Why can't they just bring that back? Or, you know, if you've been living here legally, you came here legally, you you hold employment, you hold residence, you know, why can't they just have you fill out a simple form, apply for indefinite leave to remain, and that's it. You get to stay. That's what I had to do when I first came here. And, you know, and now I'm a citizen. I applied for citizenship. I don't see what all the fuss is about. I think they're they're just making too big of a deal about it when it could be something very simple and something quick. And I don't agree that the House of the Lord should be getting involved in it. I mean, do they get involved? I don't think they really had a say in my immigration status, you know, or my application. Well, the House of Lords, I mean, the House of Lords normally, Scott, you know, what they do, there's a thing called the Salisbury Convention. And that mm -hmm. says that if, if a government is elected on a manifesto, they will not attempt to block that in the House of Lords. And, of course, what they're arguing today is that this referendum result wasn't in, in any manifesto, um, and so they are free to speak. But it kind of does feel a little bit, doesn't it? Although a sort of unelected, appointed in most cases by Tony Blair and David Cameron, class of people, um, are meddling and trying to bind the government's hands. And I suspect, Scott, they'll be rather less popular uh, this time next week than they are now, don't you? Well, I mean, from what I've been hearing, and they've never been that popular to begin with, especially after, you know, their little, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, 
their their office, their their time in office. A lot, there's a lot of different mixed emotions about them, and, and this was the whole uh, idea with the Brexit was if you look at the messengers, you know, you don't really need to listen to the the actual message. You know, when you have Wall Street putting their, you know, their uh, comments in, you have Tony Blair, you have David Cameron, you have, sure. you know, all of a sudden Obama coming in. Sure. It, it was the establishment, Scott, wasn't it? It was yeah, the establishment and, versus and, the people, you know. And, they've always, and everybody always knows that they don't have our best interest to heart. Everybody always knows that. So why this time do they? Why this time would you side with the establishment when everybody was anti-establishment? Everybody always said they're against the little people, and now the little people want to stand by them this time. Wow. What makes this time so different? And I, I didn't really need to hear too many of the arguments. I looked into the European Union when I came here. I couldn't understand it. Not that I was you know, too ignorant. I just didn't understand why Britain would have joined it to begin with. You know, well, we joined it, Scott. We joined it, Scott, because we were told a series of great big fibs. We were told it was about free trade, and we were in it with countries that were very equivalent to us. And 20 years after we joined, uh, there were no more British people working in Germany or German people working in Britain than there had been before. It was just easier to do. The problem came, Scott, when we let in 10 former communist countries and, and disproportionately large numbers of people came to Britain. I think we let too many people in, but I firmly take the view that if you were allowed in legally, those rights shouldn't be challenged. And the government, I think, has got itself into a bit of a mess. Scott, I thank you. Um, I wonder what Will in Evesham makes of, makes of tonight's debacle. I think it's absolutely right that it, that's exactly what the Lords should, 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 should be doing. And I think at last there's a bit of debate. I mean, the only rational debate I've actually heard so far is, was, was the one that in, in the Commons. And then, unfortunately, they didn't back their convictions. I thought Kenneth Clark, for instance, had a fantastic um, argument. I mean, what, what, what we've got to remember is this idea against the, the will of the people is utter rubbish. I mean... You know, I remember that the you stood in front of that poster, you know, that um, totally mis misleading poster. Do I oh, no, it was a factual poster, Well, It was a photograph. Yeah, but, it, but it was a misrepresentation, Nigel. Just, I mean, do I need to mention the word red bus? You know, with the infamous 350 million, which you then, then the very next day said no, that was a mistake. At the end of the day, people were totally misled. Do you know what, Will? We've been misled for nearly half a century on the true intentions of the European Union. Uh, Will, you and I are not going to agree on this one, but I thank you. Uh, your texts and tweets coming through. Delighted at the news. The government now has to guarantee the rights of EU nationals in the UK. We're better together, says Jack. Well, Jack, we can cooperate with each other, but the question is, we're not going to have a continuance of the free movement of people. Of that, uh, I think the British people spoke very clearly. Um, the government are in a mess, uh, and the House of Lords, in my view, have interfered a bit too much. Uh, the unelected so-called Lords are doing the EU's job for them. They'll be rubbing their hands with glee tonight in Brussels. What mugs we are. Now that Parliament has revealed some of our cards, surely the EU should reciprocate. Eddie. Eddie, you make a very good point. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It's 7.15. This is LBC, The Nigel Farage Show, live from New York. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. So the government have been defeated in the House of Lords because the Lords have said that the rights of people from the European Union who came to Britain should be guaranteed, whereas Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, had wanted this to be a negotiating chip when they go to Brussels. Here's the problem. The problem is the European summit is on the 9th and 10th of March. I know, because I'm going to be there. And the plan was that the Prime Minister would trigger Article 50 next Thursday evening. But she's just lost a vote in the House of Lords. Do we go for a game of ping-pong here, where it goes back to the Commons and then back to the Lords, or does the government simply have to concede defeat on this. Uh, all that uh, we'll find out soon, I guess. Uh, more texts and tweets. We can't trust the Tories, Nigel. Article 50 should have been evoked straight after the Brexit vote. I smell a rat, 
says Tom in Basingstoke. Paul on Facebook says the EU will make it as difficult as possible for Brexit. We all know this. Matt says that some people are calling for Lord Farage and then saying, get rid of the House of Lords in the next sentence. Hypocritical. I was never going to the House of Lords, Matt, believe me. Uh, Callum says, why should other EU countries guarantee our citizens' rights? Well, I tell you what, Callum, they will. I'll tell you why. Because the Brits that live in France, the Brits that live on the Costa del Sol, contribute a huge amount to that economy. And when they get medical care in the hospitals, do you know what? The British government actually pays the bill which doesn't happen with other EU countries when it's the other way round. Alan in Edgware, should the rights of EU citizens be I mean, Has the House of Lords got this one right, uh, Elam? To be honest, they haven't. Uh, right. The reason is, I mean, I want to quote an example, my example. What uh -huh. happened was, um, I married, um, if someone comes in, say, from any of the EU European countries and they marry a non-EU citizen... Those non-EU citizens are guaranteed benefits immediately. I married an American girl, ironically enough, from New York. Yeah. We had to fork out thousands over five years. She had to take a test. Fair enough. We're not complaining. But why is the, the land not, the, the, you know, what the old cliche is, it's a boring cliche, but a level playing field. We know someone also married an American lady recently. What happened was he couldn't marry her. They wouldn't allow her to stay. He popped along to the German embassy because his grandfather's German, got a German passport, and hey, presto, she was mm. on benefits before mm. you know it. Well, but that's I, because... I've had a company... I've, yeah. I just had... I, 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 I work in a profession that's been decimated by another organisation that pays lesser tax of transfer, pays lesser tax in, uh, to Holland, 80% less of what they would pay to HMRC. So, you know, it's, you've been shunted on both fronts. What about rights that they should stick up for, their £300 a day that they take for, to British subjects and British citizens that live in this country? The rights should be equal across the board. If they well, marry free people from outside one the, of the EU, points. They one of the points. One of the points of belief campaign we are. one of the points of belief campaign was that we should in future treat people coming into this country from across the world equally regardless whether they come from the european union from india from america uh, from Australia. And that was one of the arguments we all made on the Leave side during the campaign. So you're quite right uh, to point out that right now it's not a level playing field. All I would say to you is that whilst it seems outrageous to many uh, that some have come in uh, from the European Union and very quickly been able uh, to uh, claim all sorts of in-work benefits, get their children educated, whatever it may be, the point is that when those people came to the United Kingdom legally they were entitled to do that so surely we can't change it retrospectively can we well um i mean when brexit please god will get through then everyone should be subject to the same across the board we're just asking for everybody to be treated equally i yep. as a british citizen the british subject has put tens of thousands of pounds into the into hmrc yep. in the last 26 years have been treated appallingly, but we have a, a, a little kid now, three, four-year-old kid, thank God. Um, but, you know, she was almost threatened with deportation if you didn't have this, if you didn't have that mm. criteria and everyone else. Someone can mar come in, doesn't speak a word of English from East, Eastern, anywhere in Europe, and then marry somebody, say, from the Middle East or from... And no problem. Well, There's no problem. There's no problem with... Longer their, term. Like, longer term, we've got to sort got this out. This Longer term, we've got to sort, sort this out. But in the space of the next week, the government have got to sort this out. Um, and thank you for your call and your texts and tweets. It's very unlikely. But what happens if the EU refuses to let our citizens continue to live in Europe after we have granted their citizens the right to live here, asked Graham. Graham, they would look... Uh, I think they would become virtually international pariahs. How ironic it would be if Chancellor Merkel, having said, as many of you that want to come from North Africa can, would say that a retired British couple uh, living on the Costa del Sol and spending their pension couldn't be there. It would look ridiculous, and you know what? It ain't going to happen. Nigel, sorry to disagree with you, but all EU citizens who arrived after the referendum results must leave. Surely they knew the score when they arrived, says Anton. Well, Anton, I actually think there needs to be a cut-off at some point Goodness me, it could happen, couldn't it, next week? Theresa May could go next week 
um, on the 9th of March and say to people in Brussels, now look, huge numbers have come to our country, but actually we're going to guarantee all of, all of their rights, but hereafter we're going to be more selective. I wonder whether she will. I wonder whether she'll be able to trigger Article 50 if this dispute hasn't been sorted. I wonder what Daniel in Northampton makes of this row. Nigel, I'm absolutely furious that this evening an unelected House of Lords has done this not to protect the rights of EU citizens, but to give Theresa May and her government an absolute kicking. Mm, mm, mm. That is what they've, that's what they've sought to do. This isn't about giving rights to EU citizens. Of course, I believe that they should. I voted to leave, and yep. I believe that EU citizens' rights should be protected in Britain, as well as British expats being treated uh, the same way in the EU after yes. you leave. So you agree, Daniel, with you agree with what they voted for, but not the fact they've done it as an unelected House of Lords. This was not the time or place for this. There is we, we are about hopefully to embark on a two year negotiation period mm. and as the government have said several times we need to go into those negotiations with our cards to our chest so that we get the best deal for Britain post-Brexit. And what the House of Lords have done is effectively weakened our negotiating hand. They have potentially delayed the deadline for triggering Brexit, because that's all this 133 words is actually about, yes. is to trigger, is to start, fire the starting gun to trigger Brexit and then start the negotiations. What I'm concerned about is that the House of Lords are going to continue to do this and to continue to defy the will of the people. Now, you yourself campaigned for, for many years against an unelected bureaucratic machine, and I'm afraid what's happened tonight is we have been attacked, essentially, by an even older unelected bureaucratic machine. Yep. Yeah, Daniel, you make the point beautifully. Thank you. And on Facebook, John agrees. He says the lords and their traditions are outdated and pathetic in these modern times. Mark simply says, abolish the House of Lords. They serve no purpose. Well, actually, Mark, they have served a bit of a purpose tonight, and the government has got a big headache. I wonder what Matthew and Heathrow makes of all of this. Have the House of Lords done the right thing, Matthew, or should they have kept out of it? Well, no, I think it's right, Nigel, that the House of Lords uh, basically uh, has done the right thing, that they shouldn't be using humans as bargaining chips. I mean, the people are <laughs> now living and working legally in this country, in, and we need them for the infrastructure and the hospitals and everything. So, you know, we've just got to unilaterally say they are going to stay, and Theresa May, unfortunately, has got it wrong again. I mean, she's Yes, tried to I mean, in reality, people. Matthew, in reality, Matthew, she was never going to use this bargaining chip anyway, was she? Well, that's right, and I think it's, it's, she's got it wrong, and I think uh, you're possibly the Prime Minister in waiting, because I think things the way, I mean, Theresa May is trying to copy <laughs> what uh, you're saying about Brexit, but she's still getting it longer, wrong, and I wonder, are, are you actually ready to rejoin the Conservative Party and maybe <laughs> take over the leadership in the future? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <happening>. <laughs> no, I'm not Matthew at all. I don't really uh, like the Conservative Party very much. I don't trust them very much. I mean... I mean, it's very difficult to trust them, and particularly, I mean, this Prime Minister who says these magnificent things when she gives her high-vaunting speeches, but I saw it all when she was Home Secretary. She didn't deliver. The irony here, Matthew, is you're right in one sense. They've tried to sort of take my agenda, UKIP's agenda, and yet they've made a terrible mistake here. Because nobody, nobody, me, anybody else on the Leave campaign, ever said the rights of these people would be threatened. You know, a nation that retrospectively changes people's rights, I think you're frankly on a course to tyranny if you behave like that. Much as I disagree, Matthew, with the numbers that came, I think Theresa May's got herself in a mess. I hate the fact the House of Lords uh, may well, in principle, have done the right thing, but I don't like their meddling, Matthew. And once this is all over, Matthew, I think the House of Lords has to go. What do you think? Well, no, I, I think, I mean, they're serving their, their purpose. I mean, the, ultimately, Parliament is going to have their say, but, uh, I mean, uh, what Theresa May was trying to stop them have their say. And, uh, I mean, I think possibly then, if you want to join the Conservatives, maybe you've got to go for a coalition with... Uh, 
Liberal Devon tax. I mean, they're, they're all... Well, <laughs> who knows, Matthew, what the future holds? I don't, you don't. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively here on LBC, live from New York. It's 7.30 and time for the news with Rupert Bartier. This is LBC, The Nigel Farage Show, live from New York. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. So the government have been beaten in the House of Lords, the Lords saying that the rights of EU citizens who have come here legally should be protected and should not be a bargaining chip. And it gives the government a bit of a crisis because Theresa May intends to trigger Article 50 next Thursday. So does she accept what the House of Lords has said? Does she take it back to the House of Commons? Do we get a game of parliamentary ping pong? We will see. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we talked last night um, about Trump's up upcoming speech. Um, and a couple of points here. Firstly, uh, the Trump visit to the UK is now being reportedly not going to happen until October because of fear over protests. Originally it was talked about being in June. Uh, an autumn visit would coincide with Parliament being in recess. I wonder whether John Burko has actually had quite a lot to do with all of this. But back to the speech. Trump made his big speech to Congress last night and he reaffirmed his position on a number of issues, including the building of that wall. Let's hear we it. We must restore integrity and the rule of law at our borders. We will soon begin the construction of a great, great wall along our southern border. Well, there you are. There's Trump, he's building the wall, and he's got congressmen, and he's got senators cheering, applauding, a standing ovation when he'd finished. Um, I think most people agreed uh, that it was a very much more presidential performance than people have been used to from Trump thus far. Um, and a point to make that I think is interesting is that during the campaign, he was disavowed by many in his own party. You know, the Bushes, for example, wouldn't support him. There were congressmen, there were senators who wouldn't support him. And I remember before Christmas hearing him say that he wanted to bring back together the family of the Republican Party. I tell you what, I think he is doing that. But back to the government's dilemma. Elaine in Peterborough, what would you do if you were Mrs May this evening? Oh, Nigel, it's a very great pleasure to speak to you, and hello. Um, hello, good I'm evening. I'm sure I feel disappointed, but not surprised. We have an unelected body. Um, I think it's about 760 of them allowed to, to, um, to uh, deal with the work of the House of Lords. Yep. And about 650 MPs. Um, I, you see, I, I, I voted to leave, and I won't, will not be made to feel guilty because I think we should be able to use this as a bargaining tool. And, you do. Um, if she takes it back to the House of Commons, mm -hmm. um, I'm only worried that that will hold up Article 50 even more than it's been held up already. Mm. If she accepts it, that's one more negotiating tool that we haven't got, and the EU are going to make it as difficult for us as possible. Um, well, the e I mean, Elaine, Elaine, the EU, or the bosses of the EU, may well, to begin with, try and make it as difficult as possible in terms of trade, and, and, and in terms of trying to say to us that we've got to keep free movement of people. But maybe, Elaine... If we were not to use this as a bargaining chip, but Theresa May was to walk into that room next Thursday afternoon, evening, and say, actually, we're going to guarantee the rights of everybody that has legally come to this country, in some ways, Elaine, wouldn't that give us a slight moral upper hand? It certainly would give us... It would give us some moral high ground, yes, it would. Yes, yes, and, and we would I look like... The, and, and we'd look like the good guys, wouldn't we? Yes, we would. I'm just worried um, that... Um, I suppose what I'm really worried about is the triggering of Article 50. Mm. And because of all, you know, because of what's gone on, the appalling, yes. um, you know, backwards, forwards, um, the blame, you know, um, that, that's been placed on levers, etc. I'm sorry, it has been. Mm. Um, I just wonder um, whenever, you know, when are we going to see this? 
Well, Elaine, we've waited for months and months. You know, it's over seven months since the referendum. Uh, I'm very frustrated. Th 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 this wasn't done far more quickly. But we have a, a timeline now. She wants to trigger it in Brussels on the 9th of March. Uh, she absolutely has to do that. If she delays this, by the way, we go on another couple of months, we'll finish up in 2019 with Britain standing in the European elections again, with us being p still part of the thing. So, Elaine, she's got to get on with it. Uh, I do sense your worry. I do sense your frustration. I think a lot of people feel like that. Um, it isn't the principle tonight that worries me. Uh, what worries me is the government's misjudgment in, in this. I don't think they should ever have made this an issue. And I can't stand the fact the unelected House of Lords has intervened in this way. And I'm not alone in thinking this. Um, I've got a tweet here. The Turkeys just voted for Christmas. The anti-democratic Lords vote tonight will never be forgotten or forgiven. I sense you may be right. I want to know what Nigel Farage would replace the House of Lords with if this gets to him. Daniel from Reading. Well, it did, Daniel. Um, and I think we are going to have to have, ultimately, some kind of Senate, but, but uh, with a lot of, of genuine expert committees, because the point about the House of Lords is that it's a reforming chamber. Its job is to look at legislation and say to governments, you may have got this wrong, think again. Separate debate, I know, to what we're talking about tonight, but relevant nonetheless. George in Walthamstow, does Mrs May have to give way on this one? Well, um, yeah, probably. Um, I've got three quick things to say. First of all, look, it's a non-issue anyway. No one has ever spoken about repatriation of any, anybody, so it's really a non-issue. Agreed. Um, but what's happened, well, what we should do is we should avoid a ping-pong game. Um, and if this is the best that people who are blocking Brexit can come up with, then it's not too bad for us, us Brexiteers, really. I think you should in incorporate it and then press the button. So... I think yep. it's an honest issue. I think she should get on with it. Um, and the worst is, is that we've shown our hand, which is which is really silly. Um, but labour-inspired people do this, don't they? You remember Gordon Brown selling the gold, telling us when he was going to sell it, how much for? <laughs> I do. On the eve of when it was just about to go through the roof, the, the prices of gold. That's well, it was worse called. than that, George, actually. It was worse than that, because what he did, he announced the 17 dates on which he would be selling it and the amounts he'd be selling. And guess what happened, George? The market went <laughs> straight down. He sold the whole lot at an average price of $284 an ounce, and it's now 1150 and it's been up to near 2000 um, in the meantime. So, so yeah, government's competence um, is not always high. But, George, basically... Well, Labour hasn't got the one, one more point, though. Labour Go hasn't on. got the hang of it, clearly. One more point. He who plays the piper calls the tune... Neil Kinnock is paid £1,700 a week by the European Union in the form of a platinum, no, it's even better than platinum, pension. So, you know, is he not conflicted? And does this not, is this not another example why we have to chase, uh, uh, we have to change the, the upper house? Uh, well, actually, actually, George, the upper house is an extremely Europhile place. There are plenty of people in that house uh, who have EU pensions who never declare them as, 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 as a matter of interest when they get up to speak. Um, and the rest of the House of Lords is basically the friends of the establishment, the friends of Tony Blair, the friends of David Cameron. Uh, yes, an upper chamber of some kind to review legislation, to bring in expertise, is, of course, a good thing. Uh, but I have a feeling that now uh, what we've got is so far removed, actually, from ordinary Britain uh, that, it, that it doesn't serve any purpose, George, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, I agree with you. He needs to, some kind of Senate arrangement with, with, with some, some special... So some, there's, there's a better way of getting know-how savvy and specialist knowledge into the parliamentary process. And it's not through the Lords, it's through specialist committees and people who really know. If they keep the House of Lords, can't you get in there and do what you did in the European Union? What, you mean have some fun? Make some points? Upset everybody, George? Is that what you're saying I should do? <laughs> get, get, get in there and change it. Well, um, I'm not sure 
that I've succeeded in changing the European Parliament, although what I think I have done um, is make more people aware of it, uh, because through uh, YouTube and other things like that, a lot of people have now engaged with the European Parliament uh, and understand that it actually exists, which they didn't before. George, I, you know, I, I, I certainly, if I was in the current House of Lords, I think I'd have no impact whatsoever. Um, if it was to be a Senate, well, that might be different, but I suspect that's a long way down the road. In the short term, the difficulty is that we've got this deadline of March the 9th, and, George, you make the point that, actually, uh, if anything had to be lost through the courts, through the House of Commons, through the House of Lords, if anything had to be lost, this one wasn't a bad one to lose, because whilst it may have been intended to be part of the government's negotiating hand, in reality, they were never ever going to use it, we would have looked really, I think, deeply unreasonable had we taken that approach. So now the Prime Minister, uh, she can decide what to do, but she can go along next Thursday to Brussels, take the moral high ground, say, look, we're the good guys on this, it'll be different in the future, we can't have unrestricted free movement of people, we're going to start treating people from all over the world equally, uh, but after we've done this, can we now start talking, please, about a sensible trade deal? At least I hope George, that's what's going to happen next week. I thank you for your call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. The time now is 7.45. The Nigel Farage Show, live from New York, only on LBC. We're triggering Article 15 next Thursday, and tonight the government suffers a defeat uh, at the hands of the unelected House of Lords, because uh, the House of Lords have said that the rights of EU citizens who came to Britain legally should be guaranteed, and the government had wanted to use that as a bargaining chip. And I wonder what John in Germany thinks. Jo John, do you live in Germany full-time? Um, I, I tend to sort of come back and forward. I did live here for many decades, but uh, I'm right. predominantly more in Glasgow, but I'm, I'm over here again. Uh, so, were, John, just let me ask you, I mean, were you worried about your rights to live and work in Germany at any point since the Brexit vote? No. Uh, no. At the end of the day, I'm somebody who originally uh, migrated over here uh, before the, the Maastricht Treaty back in '83, where, where the European Economic Community allowed uh, people to move and work in other countries. But there wasn't the right to just move and look for a job. You had to have a job to go to, and you yes. also had to prove that you weren't, uh, you weren't going to be a burden on the state. You had to come in, show your cards, get your residence permit for one year, we'll see how we go, and if after a year or two years you become a burden on the state, then it's back to UK. <laughs> Uh, yes. And that was the way it was up until the 90s. And that, John, presumably, you thought was a, a perfectly fair system? Of course. Uh, and yes. I've seen no reason to suppose that that would have ever changed. People lived and existed before, uh, before uh, these treaty changes in the 90s. The difficulty we have, and it's the same we have in Scotland, where there's now, uh, you know, not young people, people who are in their late 20s, early 30s, who, uh, you know, they can't remember what it was like before, that we existed before. Yes. The, yes. the world went on. <laughs> yeah, no, I take that. No, I mean, I mean, John, John, actually, free movement, before the First World War, there were no passports. People could move wherever they liked, but I think probably the argument is it was only the rich that could do it. So, so John, yes. what, I mean, what do you think Mrs May's negotiating position, her stance should be next Thursday at this big summit with Angela Merkel and the others in Brussels? Well, at the end of the day, I don't think it really any, there's any realistic doubt that people who have genuinely settled in the United Kingdom um, aren't a burden on the state, which is very important. They aren't a burden on the state, have work, haven't cre been creating, cri causing crime, etc. that these people clearly uh, should have the right to stay, as no doubt people are in the United Kingdom. But the House of Lords, this... Frankly, um, you know, it's, it's basically it's almost like a, a Walter Mitty importance grandstanding. That isn't the forum to have this kind of debate. Um, it's like the SNP in Scotland unilaterally deciding they're staying in the EU. The trouble is they haven't asked the European Union or the other countries whether they want them, and the answer is no. <laughs> uh, so it, it's the wrong forum to have this kind of thing. Uh, it's grandstanding, it's self-importance. Uh, they should let the government get on with it. Right. John? Thank you very much indeed. You made all your points beautifully. And Catherine on Facebook says, I'm an American. We need more than a wall. We need to change laws and dry up benefits for non-US citizens. OK, Catherine, we've got it. Uh, Joy says, the silly lords have cut off their noses and spited their faces. Lee says, it's like a car licence. 
if you if you pass before 1997, you can drive up to seven and a half tons. They didn't change the law and take it off you. The immigrants can stay, as the law was that way at the time. Well, Lee, that is the view strongly that I take. And Bob says, if a bill was passed in the Commons to get rid of the Lords, would the House of Lords have the final say on it? Well, um, I, this, of course is a debate that's gone on since 1911, uh, Bob, uh, when uh, Asquith was trying to reform the House of Lords. He threatened to uh, make 500 new peers to flood it. Um, ultimately, uh, to change the House of Lords, to get rid of the House of Lords, as it is, is going to need a government with a general election majority, uh, possibly uh, backed up by a referendum. I'd love to see a referendum on should we have, you know, Peter Mandelson and co sitting in the House of Lords. That would be great, great sport. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure uh, that, uh, that, that the Lords would get a very fair hearing from the British public, because I think overwhelmingly we would think uh, that it's out of date and it's time for us to move on. Um, our next caller, who is our next caller? Doug in Lancashire is our next caller. Doug, uh, what do you make of Mrs May's dilemma? Well, I'm concerned right, uh, this evening, Nigel, given the fact that um, the House of Lords has uh, voted against um, the thing. Something that's cropped up today that's been brought to my attention is the moment that, given the fact that we are struggling to get Article 50 invoked by the 31st of March, mm -hmm. I'm aware, or correct me if I'm wrong, that there is a, a new thing coming in called the Qualified Majority Vote, into the EU that says that as from the 31st of March, if Article 50 has not been invoked in the UK, then it will be up to 14 EU member states to support our decision to leave. That is very disturbing. Well, there is, yeah, I mean, I mean there are changes, Doug. Right? Yeah, yeah, there are changes coming to the voting rules on the European Council, um, and ultimately, uh, Doug, what nobody's really thought about in this country is that the moment we do uh, declare Article 50, effectively, uh, we've knocked the ball back to their side of the net, uh, and they're in charge of where it goes. And I think one or two people may be shocked um, after Article 50 is triggered, um, how much we're in their hands. And there's all sorts of wordings about, you know, the European Council can debate uh, and make decisions on things that affect us, that affect us, um, but without us having a say. And ultimately, Doug, ultimately, Doug, um, ultimately, it is the European Parliament that can veto the deal at the end of the day. So this may not be an easy process, Doug. No, but what this, this article is saying is that if we don't trigger Article 50 by the 31st of March, we've lost the argument, we've lost the battle. It's up to the EU coming in because of a new rule within the EU. Well... I wouldn't buy that completely, Doug. Um, it may get more tricky, but the point is the European summit, the meeting of 28 heads of state, takes place at the end of next week in Brussels. That is the moment to do it. She's got a week to sort things out. Uh, Peter, in Hazelmere, what do you make of Mrs May's dilemma? To the point, Nigel, um, Mrs May was a Remainer. Mm -hmm. God bless her. She changed her mind when she was made Prime Minister, became a, a Lever. I'm yep. a committed Lever like yourself. Mm -hmm. That was a massive change of, uh, of position. This is a minor change of position because it was never an issue. She's made yes. it an issue. She can get out of it by simply turning around the other way. And just think about the fact that in France, when they had their elections, there's going to be a new president. Whoever's elected is going to be in favor of Great Britain remaining in contact with France. Angela Merkel made a decision unilaterally to bring a million people to her country without she discussing did. it with anybody. Yep. As you said so many times, the Spanish will welcome us with open arms. She's just changed her mind. Her respect will go up for me if she does that. Right. And uh, we'll get on with it. So, Peter, when you voted Brexit, n not for one second did you think we'd start mass deportations of people who'd legally come to Britain, did you? Absolutely not. I mean, apart from no. the fact that I'm married to an Italian girl and two of my children were born in France, I've got a Danish sister-in-law and Australian cousins. <laughs> yes, absolutely not. I mean, they're entitled to be here, just like my wife's grandparents came here after the Second World War. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, oh. and, and yeah, and, and Peter, what we're saying is, in the future, there will be people who come to live, work, and settle in our country from other European countries. It's just the rules will be stricter, we'll have a limit, and it'll be tough, much tougher to access benefits for many years. That's really what this is about, isn't it? Absolutely, it should be, as you said many times, Nigel. This has to be an equal situation for everybody, irrespective of where they come from in the world. If they all happen to come from the European Union because they they're better qualified, so be it. But, yes. Um, let's get this one off her back. Come on, Theresa, make a decision. Yeah, no, I, 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 before. I, Change your mind. Yeah, no, I, Peter, I agree with you absolutely completely on all the points you made on that call, and I wonder what Daniel in Richmond thinks. Yeah, hi, Nigel. Um, well, just a quick one, because I just have a minute, apparently. Um, I am German. I came to this country ten years ago. My wife is born in Pakistan, so also an immigrant. We both voted for Brexit. Um, I was on the, a part of the Liberal Party back in Germany five years ago, which I left because I was against the euro, I saw it failing, it's a macroeconomic disaster. Um, if anything, there should be north and south euro, uh, if anything. Um, mm. I don't know if you agree on that. Um, it's a bit late for that, uh, isn't it, really? It, it is, but um, um, just to let you know, I think it's a terrible um, timing in the sense that we're, we're losing, and I'm very much pro-Brexit, and we have a very good position, and we're a great country. Um, you know, we need to be great again. Um, but um, it's a terrible time from the House of Lords. Um, that should have been... And I never was fearful of being deported uh, no. further down the line. No. So I, I think this is just a big media fuss. We're just scaring tactics. Uh, yeah, no, I think you're right. Daniel, I think you're right. Daniel, you're right. Thank you. And, and, and that is my first and final thought on this subject. None of us who fought this referendum did so to say we should retrospectively change the law on people's rights who'd come to the country legally. We're not that kind of country. Yes, I think we let too many people in, but we did it legally. That's the point. It would be an outrage to suggest that somehow you came legally and a country like us is retrospectively going to change the law. I think the government got this one wrong. I think rather than this being a bargaining chip, this actually is where she should go in next Thursday, claim the high moral ground, uh, and whilst it bugs me to say it, just accept what the House of Lords have said. And you know what? We can get rid of them at some point in the not-too-distant future, because I really think we should. Coming up at 10 o'clock, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you, and we're going to continue this conversation. As we've heard in the last hour that the government has been defeated on the Brexit bill, Piers backing an amendment to protect... Afterwards, and that's why the government has taken this position. You're quite right, Nigel. There was cross, uh, there was a cross uh, support, you know, across the Leave campaign during the during the referendum uh, campaign for. Uh, the rights of EU nationals already living in the UK to be able to remain here uh, and uh, th there was a heated debate about it between, as I referred to earlier, Will Straw, the director of the Remain campaign who said this could be an issue and, uh, and Peter Bone of Grassroots out uh, uh, but Theresa May, and this is the issue for Theresa May because she's always been very clear that by implementing Brexit she is implementing uh, the will of the British people, she's implementing what people voted for on June the 23rd but this is something that people didn't vote for on June the 23rd because it wasn't part of uh, the Leave campaign, uh, Leave, Leave campaign manifesto. Now, moving on, I've just got I've been uh, key moments, if you like, in this debate. Uh, Baroness Hater of Kentish Town opened the debate for the Labour Party. And it's legitimate of them to think they're being used as negotiating capital, because that's exactly what the Home Office told them. Now, all of three, these three million, and indeed the four of us whose names are on. What does the government now do? Uh, yes, we are now into the territory of parliamentary ping-pong. Uh, the government has been defeated on an amendment, tabled cross-party amendment, but tabled by the Labour benches, uh, which would safeguard the rights of EU nationals living in the UK, there are around three million of them, before uh, Theresa May triggers Article 50. They've been defeated by 102 votes. 358 plays 256. It's a big defeat. And, of course, now the bill heads back to the Commons, it will be overturned. But while that's going on, Nigel, there are going to be lots of backroom negotiations to try and pick off those uh, Conservative peers, and we'll get the list soon, who rebelled against their own party to say, hang on a moment, you cannot defy the will of the British people on this one, because Theresa May, in her view...
Prime Minister's view needs to be able to head into those negotiations with the strongest hand uh, possible. And the government's take on this is if it cannot, uh, it, it does not need uh, to go into those negotiations having already guaranteed the rights of EU nationals because, of course, those 27 other EU member states haven't guaranteed uh, the rights of British expats living abroad, predominantly Spain and then France and Germany. Uh, Leading Britain's conversation. Isn't it funny? You know, when I came here 17 years ago and I said that I wanted to lead a campaign to get Britain to leave the European Union, you all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you're not laughing now, are you? I don't want to be rude, but you have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day! Yourself, Mr. Van Rompuy, say that the euro has brought us stability. I could applaud you for having a sense of humour. Yes, I want you, Zach, Mr. Schultz, as well. I want you all five. Nigel Farage. 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 The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald. Well, the government have just been defeated in the House of Lords, and this, of course, is part of a long battle ever since Independence Day on June the 23rd last year. There have been attempts through the High Court, attempts through the Supreme Court, attempts through the House of Commons, and now the government finally in the House of Lords has been defeated on something. Interestingly, at this point about whether EU citizens that legally came to this country should have their rights guaranteed is something that completely unified the Leave campaign last year. Not one campaigner ever suggested those people who'd come legally should have their rights questioned. Many of us thought uh, that immediately after Brexit or perhaps after the declaration of Article 50 we should start putting some limits on. Uh, but it was the government, it was Amber Rudd, uh, who seems to think this should be used as a negotiating chip. Now, given that there are about three and a half million EU nationals living in the UK and a million or fewer UK citizens living in Europe, uh, one wonders how much of a chip she really thought this was. Uh, but I want to go straight to Theo Usherwood, BBC's political correspondent. Theo, the government have been defeated. Theresa May is supposed to be going next Thursday to Brussels to trigger Article 50. The amendment also share a real concern for those UK expats who, thanks to their EU membership, have settled in one of the other 27 countries. Now, uh, in the past week, there's been a bit of a heated row between Lord Tebbit and Michael Heseltine. Lord Tebbit even saying on LBC that he thinks Lord Heseltine, for his Remain, uh, Remain rhetoric, should be kicked out of the Conservative Party. Uh, and he didn't miss the opportunity in this debate uh, to have uh, another dig at his old foe. I think I should, first of all, in a manner which has not been followed by anybody else in this House today, declare my interest in this matter. I have... First of all, a nephew who has lived and worked in Germany for 20 years. And I have a Danish son-in-law who has lived in this country for over 30 years. Secondly, I would like to say what an extraordinary experience it has been here today. Yeah. First of all, we have been unfortunately and unusually denied